good day and thank you very much for the invitation um, to present today. I'm Steve Saxon. I'm a partner with McKinsey and Company and I'm based in Shanghai, China. I lead McKinsey's travel practice across Asia. I've been with McKinsey 20 years now, um, the last 15 of which have been in Asia. I'll talk today about the road to recovery. Um, shining a lesson on some of the, uh, shining a spotlight on some of the lessons learned and where we go from here. In particular, I'll look at what's been happening in the China market, which I think, as we all know, has recovered earlier than many other Asian markets, and seeing what we can learn and maybe what we can't learn for other markets as well. A note, though, before we start, I think. We all need to recognize that COVID-19, first and foremost, is a global humanitarian crisis. Even as of today, there are still tens of thousands of deaths happening per day from the virus, and health professionals are battling heroically to save lives. Our first priority as a firm is in supporting them and in the virus response. We also think as well as saving lives, it's important to preserve and save livelihoods. And that's where restarting travel safely and appropriately comes in. Travel and tourism employs tens of millions of people across Asia and is vital to the economic success of these countries. So we have a dual focus, preserving lives and also preserving livelihoods. And today we'll talk more around what it takes to restart travel in a responsible way to enable people to travel again and save those livelihoods. So a few observations from the recovery so far. So um, first of all, regarding Asia, China is leading the recovery. Domestic travel has been practically back to normal. Other countries vary significantly. It depends on the virus spread within the country and also whether or not they, they have a domestic market. International borders across Asia remain substantially closed. There's some good news for the industry. We do see significant latent demand. When borders open again, leisure travel will likely bounce back quickly. Corporate travel is likely to be a little more subdued. Some of the lessons from China will be relevant across Asia, but not all of them. And we'll draw some parallels and, and look what other countries may be able to learn from China's earlier recovery. So first, let's compare where we are in terms of some facts. This chart looks at the percentage change between 2019 and 2020 across air passengers in different markets. And first of all, you see that as of September, China domestic air passengers just about poked above the line. Um, it actually fell back a little bit again in October, but um, I think we see pretty much a 100% recovery now for domestic air travel within China. Other countries with a significant domestic market have also had some recovery. So Thailand um, is now back up to around 70% of pre-crisis levels. What's holding Thailand back from reaching 100% is, is the lack of foreign tourists in the country. China's domestic market is mostly for the local population. It is business travel and friends and relatives. Thailand has a significant proportion of foreign tourists traveling domestically as well, which means its domestic air recovery is a little slower. Japan was on a good path um, with the resurgence of the virus. We saw it, we thought we saw it fall back. But countries in general with a domestic travel market do recover quicker. You'll note here that all of the international air passenger lines remain stubbornly stuck to the bottom of the chart. And this is because of the quarantine restrictions in place and the travel restrictions in place, which unfortunately are likely to remain for some time. Let's have a look at the, um, the outlook in terms of consumer confidence. Um, the first row on this chart shows the confidence in your country's recovery. I think we see there's a couple of outliers here. China and India both are, have very confident consumers in terms of believing that their country will recover well post pandemic. That's not true across Asia. Um, most are slightly negative, such as Australia here. Japan is an, unfortunately an outlier in the other direction where people are more pessimistic. However, even the trend in, China, in Japan is positive. So over time, the, as, as we repeat our surveys, we do see the confidence level increasing. In terms of what people are worried about, 
um, income declines, spending declines, and potentially reductions of their savings as well. Let's turn to look a little deeper at China's recovery now. And this chart is the same, similar to the one you saw before. So it looks at the percentage change between 2019 and 2020. But this focuses just on mainland China. And we look at different types of travel and also logistics to give you a picture of what's happening in China. And really, there's three stories here. The first one is um, the, the, the one at the top, so express shipments. Um, express has, was already booming in China and has continued to boom through the, through the crisis. As people have remained at home, increased e-commerce, increased online ordering, um, express continued its rapid, um, its rapid growth. Associated with that, we then see the export related areas. So the, if you look at container throughput or you look, or you look at trucking, for example, um, here we see that initially there was a, a supply shock. So the, the factories in China were closed, so demand did drop. However, more recently, there's actually been a significant growth versus the previous year. And that's been caused by, in fact, increased demand from developed markets. While consumers in the US and Europe are, are locked down at home, they're actually spending more online and they're spending on physical goods. In the past, they may have spent uh, their disposable income on services like haircuts, poodle salons, travel, and so on. Now they're locked down at home and they're spending that same money instead on physical goods. And therefore we're actually seeing a significant spike in demand for exports from China. You then have a next grouping, which looks at the domestic travel. So domestic air passengers, as we already saw, is pretty much recovered. Hotel room nights is the same, um, mostly supported by the domestic business travel and also domestic leisure travel. Subway passengers is back close to where it was last year driven by um, everyday life is, is, is broadly back to normal. Rail passengers has grown a little slower. And that's, that's an interesting takeaway from this. Like what we saw with the air passengers was actually very, some significant stimulation happening. So the, the airlines were doing discounts, were doing subscription-based schemes to persuade the travelers to come back. And in terms of the numbers, it's worked. So we've seen domestic air travel recover quicker than domestic high-speed rail travel. The high-speed rail did not offer the same extent of discounts as the Chinese airlines did. Unfortunately, international remains suddenly at the bottom on this chart as well with international air passengers and also the international cruises practically closed still. A note of positive though. So um, in our surveys, um, we ask sort of where are you interested in traveling next? And there's still a significant proportion of consumers out there who want to travel internationally. 31% um, of consumers in our August survey, for example, talked about, okay, I'm interested in short distance or long distance destinations for my, for my next trip. So although they can't travel at the moment, we still do see a strong latent demand. And this is consistent with what we've seen in other markets as well. As soon as travel restrictions come down, that latent demand is, is that pent up demand is immediately released and we see flights, hotels, packages sell out again relatively quickly. So once the travel restrictions are removed for China or for the destination markets, we do think that demand, leisure demand will come back quickly. In terms of the recovery in China, it's broadly as you would expect. It started off with the young and single, it then moved on to families and now, everyone is comfortable traveling again. It started off within city, then spread to the broader area around the city, and now the longer haul domestic destinations are back to normal. And there's been a slight shift in preferences. Self-guided trips came back first, small group travel, and then now the, the borders are mostly open again for the larger scale tour groups. I think we would expect this pattern to be similar for other countries in Asia, and also the China outbound travel when this recovers as well. In terms of what sort of trips are popular, food trips were always popular pre-crisis as well, but they remain the top ranked choice about why people are traveling. We've then seen a jump and an increase in interest in natural landscape tourism, 
beach and resort based tourism. So I think for obvious reasons, people are more interested in visiting less crowded locations, exploring the outdoors than they are visiting say, crowded, congested landmarks within, um, within a city. This is illustrated um, if you look, for example, at the destinations, the summer vacation destinations. The black dots here show you the top 10 ranked destinations in 2019. The blue dots show you the top 10 ranked destinations in 2020. And you can see a clear shift. There's a shift away from the East Coast cities towards more inland destinations, which are more outdoors and more rural. In addition, the number one is Sanya, which shows the strong interest in resort travel. What else has shifted? Oh, social and video was more important than ever. Um, during lockdown, people have spent their time at home consuming social media. And we've seen a particular takeoff in things like online video streaming platforms for selling travel packages. Digital and social was already important, but it's now more important than ever appealing to the Chinese consumer. We see this as a common theme across Asia as well. So with international borders closed for the time being, that means tourism is domestic. And whether or not that's a good thing or a bad thing depends on which country you're looking at. For some countries, actually tourism turning domestic can be a big win. And actually by far the largest is China. What this chart shows is that if we were to look historically, um, 238 billion US dollars would be more would be spent by Chinese tourists outside China than would be spent by foreign tourists traveling into China. Therefore, China was by far a net exporter of tourists. Other countries, including the UK, Germany, and so on, are in the same position. There are more people leaving those countries than there are visiting those countries. What that means is if all Chinese tourists, instead of flying to Japan, Korea, Europe, and so on, stayed at home and spent that same money instead, the Chinese domestic economy would be $238 billion better off. Now, obviously, that won't be true. Likely, if people stay at home, they probably spend slightly less. But still, there's a big win for the domestic tourism industry here in China from those international borders remaining closed. Unfortunately, markets such as um, Indonesia, Thailand and so on are towards the bottom end of this list. They were net importers of tourists and they're having a very tough time of it because of the international borders remaining closed. Um, one area in particular that we've seen a big spike is actually some of the top end resorts within China. Previously, the more affluent tourists would have traveled to Japan or to Hong Kong for shopping for the weekend. Now they're staying in China and they're seeing, okay, what resorts can I explore within two to three hours of the, of the major tier one cities? So in terms of drawing out strategies for the other countries, we broadly see two different types of, um, of strategies which countries are following. One we call the zero case first. Um, and markets following this kind of policy would include Australia, New Zealand, Vietnam, Thailand, in fact, many of the Asian markets, where basically they're saying, look, we want to get to zero or practically zero cases of COVID-19 domestically, and then we will encourage travel again. Domestic travel will come back, but within these zero case first markets, we may also see some travel bubbles or sort of in agreements that, it's, that you can travel between these countries without quarantine. We think for these markets, the relevance of what we've seen in China is, is, is high. There's a series of other markets, which we call balance and manage markets, which would include much of, um, much of Europe, would include India, where look, the strategy is, look, let's not overwhelm the healthcare systems. Let's try and maintain COVID-19 at a manageable level, but we recognize we're unlikely to beat it completely until we get a vaccine. The, the lessons I think from China are less relevant to these markets because there is still a real fear of people that they will catch the virus when traveling, um, when, when traveling, and that depresses demand. What we've seen in China is that consumer confidence in travel is pretty much back to normal levels. There's still some caution there, and people will still wear masks and take extra precautions on the journey, but by and large, people are comfortable traveling again. So I think the the, the lessons we've seen from the China market are going to be less relevant to these balance and managed markets. So in for 
countries in this zero case first market, um, what would our recommendations be? First of all, get demand to come back first and then focus on building value. Like the Chinese airlines have done, for example, they rebuilt customer confidence with some deep discounts and some innovative subscription schemes. Now they're trying to increase the pricing levels back more towards normal levels, but can really stimulate that demand to come back first to rebuild the consumer confidence. Secondly, investing in new and emerging um, domestic destinations. Travel is going to remain domestic for a while. So innovating the product to cater better to the local consumers. And we've seen that shift away from kind of the city landmarks towards the resorts and towards the outdoor destinations. So investing in promoting and developing those sorts of destinations. Thirdly, the time for digital really is now. It already was critically important, but I think the consumers have even more started to focus on digital channels through the COVID-19 crisis. And finally, explore gradual reopening. Um, I think we've seen some discussion about travel bubbles opening up and they're going to be between zero countries. For example, China, mainland China has now fully opened to Macau um, with tests required, but no quarantine required. There's a one way travel bubble opened up with Australia allowing visitors from New Zealand. And I think we've all seen the discussions around the Hong Kong Singapore travel bubble, which at the moment is on hold. But sort of the principle of that, I think we think it, it, it remains solid and is likely to be the first way that international travel comes back. It requires that the countries trust each other's results, trust each other's testing and certification methods. Um, but we do see this as a good way of starting to get some tourism moving before the, before the zero countries are comfortable removing the, the inbound quarantine completely. I think before the zero countries are comfortable saying, look, we're going to allow anyone in, we're going to need to see herd immunity develop through vaccination in much of the rest of the world. And that's probably um, uh, uh, between six and 12 months away. So thank you very much um, for listening today. A few closing thoughts. Travel will be back. People traveling more has been one of the strongest mega trends that we've seen over the last 50 years. People are living in different parts of the world. There are many more visiting friends and relatives and people are curious about seeing the world. Travel will come back. And we've seen that already where travel restrictions have been removed, that demand does come back quite quickly. You need to be prepared though to track and respond quickly. Um, the travel restrictions can change relatively abruptly. And so being flexible in terms of capacity deployment, in terms of marketing to adapt to where the recovery is happening from. Investing now in the um, for the for the changes in the consumer behavior, the we think some of this is going to stick. The shift towards digital channels, the increased interest in leisure and resort destinations, so investment investing further into those areas. All of this though requires you to be incredibly agile. Thank you very much. I've enjoyed talking to you today. Um, you can scan the QR code for more access to um, McKinsey's research on travel and tourism. Here is some of the some of the snapshots we publish fairly regularly um, on travel recovery, both in Asia and also more broadly. Thank you very much, and I wish you a great conf conference.